Hello, fellow Royal Overseas League members and non-members, wherever you may be. My name is Michael McKay. Thank you for joining us. And thanks to the wonders of Zoom, I'm sitting at my desk not far from Geneva in Switzerland, and I'm personally delighted to have been asked to be your interlocutor, your host today for this conversation, this farewell conversation with our Director General. Dr. Diana Owen has been Director General since December 2017, and those three years have simply flown by, or at least it seems to me. Hello, Dr. Owen, Diana, if I may, it's good to see you again, even though we're only joined by Zoom and not sitting in the same room. Hi, Michael, good to be here from a very, very soggy Stratford-upon-Avon in the Midlands. I'm sorry to hear that, we have sunshine in Geneva. Before we start our conversation, uh, Diana, let me say a few words about you for the benefit of those who might not know you well. But first of all, I will let, to all of you watching and listening, there'll be time at the end of the interview for you to put a few questions, two or three, to Diana Owen. But these must be submitted in writing as the interview progresses. Feel free to write in your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and keeping your written questions as brief as possible. And I'll do my best, I promise you, to read them out to Diana before we close in about one hour from now. Now, many of you watching or listening will probably be aware that the job of the Director General comes with additional responsibilities, but not know exactly what those responsibilities are. Well, let me enlighten you. For example, being a trustee of the Royal Overseas League Golden Jubilee Trust, sitting on the Council of the Mayfair and St. James's Association, being a member of the Council of Commonwealth Societies and numerous other Commonwealth related bodies, and also being a member of the Association of London Clubs. Before Diana arrived at Overseas House, she had had a distinguished and rather different career, which would make many of us, me for example, green with envy. For 10 years, she was in Stratford upon Avon as Director and Chief Executive of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. That meant she was also an honorary governor of the Royal Shakespeare Company, member of the Executive Committee and the Congress Committee of the International Shakespeare Association, board member of Shakespeare's Birthplace America, Vice President of the Stratford upon Avon National Trust Association, and member of the National Trust Regional Advisory Board. Diana was also chair of the Midlands Museum Council and a judge for the annual UK Museums and Heritage Awards. Dream jobs, all of them. And the list continues. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, founding member of the Foundation for Historic Buildings in Assam in India, and a member of the Advisory Council of the Balipara Foundation. And in past times, before Stratford, she also worked in management for the National Trust all over England, where she was responsible for large estates, stretches of coastline and countryside. She represented the National Trust of four public inquiries. Now, if you're exhausted listening to all of that, Diana wasn't. She also found time, believe it or not, to write two books, A Guide to the Servants' Quarters at Petworth House, that's in West Sussex, for those who don't know, and Shakespeare and Stratford, A Global Phenomenon, and numerous other papers for conferences in the US, in Canada, and China. There's more, but time presses me. In June, 2018, Diana was awarded the OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours for her services to culture and tourism, deservedly so. Director General, Diana, it's a privilege for me to be sitting here in front of you via Zoom on behalf of all our members. Let's start our conversation. Perhaps as an ROSL member living abroad and not visiting overseas house as often as I used to, my first question might seem out of place, but it's not my intention to be intrusive. Seems that you only arrived yesterday, Diana, and you're leaving already. Are there special pressures in running an international London club of which we, the members, might not be aware? Good question, Michael, and thanks for that lovely introduction. I have indeed been immensely lucky in my career to work in many beautiful places and with wonderfully inspiring people. Um, after 10 years in Stratford, as you said, as, as Director and Chief Executive of the Shakespeare Trust, I had decided to take a break because 2016 had been a massive year for Shakespeare lovers everywhere as it had been the 
400th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth and um, sorry Shakespeare's death my goodness I've already got that in a muddle but um, I was then approached about this job at the Royal Overseas League and it was an area that um, very much interested me as my PhD had been on the subject of the development of soft power by Britain um, and I in some ways I felt it was quite similar to what I'd done before i.e in caring for um, historic properties and also uh, working with membership organizations however I should have known from my previous experience that it was very different role to the one that I was expecting um, as you all know I was immediately hit with the decision to close Edinburgh our clubhouse uh, in Prince's Street um, and then the collapse of our infrastructure in London at our London clubhouse but I do feel now that I've got Rosal to a point where it is much, much stronger. And my decision is not linked to the COVID crisis in any way. We're now going to have a new board and a governance structure. We've got a very strong management team in place and a plan for repairing and restoring the clubhouse mm -hmm. over the next um, five, 10 years or so. But I feel that we need someone now in this role who has the energy and commitment to take Rosal to the next stage. And I just didn't feel that I had the time or the commitment to be able to do that for the next few years. I read somewhere that whereas chief executives used to stay in post for five or ten years like I had done and the lifespan of a chief executive now is much shorter more like three or five years they're just burnt out and it, I do feel a little of that it is a very full-on 24-7 job and sometimes I feel you just have to listen to your heart when you're making big decisions like this. And it just feels that this is the right moment for me to step aside and welcome a new director general, a very competent di director general to the Royal Overseas League. And I hope that um, members will give her the support and the space that she needs to settle in and will also respect the expertise of our professional teams um, who are very, very uh, professional, our staff in place because it can be a very difficult environment to work in. It's true what you say, the, um, the uh, duration of CEOs seems to be getting shorter and shorter in corporate life. Um, so I think people, if they realize that, should have a lot of sympathy with people who have jobs at the top. But Diana, what would you say were your, the defining moments of your time at the Royal Overseas League? Well, I wanted to tell you a story, actually, Michael, because there is one day that really illustrates what a crazy world I stepped into. Um, I remember, I think I'd only been there about a week, um, maybe 10 days, and I attended our carol service in London and a tea afterwards. And then I caught a late train to Edinburgh, arriving at our clubhouse at about midnight for the first time. The next day, I met the staff at the clubhouse and the Edinburgh committee to confirm that the Central Council decided to close the building early in the new year, so in a matter of weeks, um, which, as you can imagine, was quite traumatic for everyone up there. Um, and the ramifications of that decision probably occupied, I would say, at least 50% of my first year at Rosal. I then returned to London on the train, arrived at the clubhouse, and shortly afterwards was summoned down to the kitchens to find that all the boilers had packed up at the clubhouse and that the main kitchen was flooded with water pouring through the walls. It really wasn't a very good start. And so my complete focus for that first few months, even year, was on the compliance works in the clubhouse and the um, situation in Edinburgh. And then, of course, ultimately, we sold the Edinburgh clubhouse uh, last year. And so those two events certainly set the agenda for that first year. But there were lots of other marvellous moments as well. I mustn't paint it all as a picture of gloom and doom because we had some, had some wonderful times as well. And of course, we had the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London in 2018, which was very significant, as well as things like the service in Westminster Abbey, the annual music competition, the um, Rosal Arts Programme in Edinburgh during the festival. All wonderful, wonderful um, occasions and great learning opportunities for me as well. I really enjoyed meeting all the members and getting under the skin of the organisation. It sounds like uh, Murphy of Mercy. Murphy's Law may well have been a member of the Royal Overseas League when you, <laughs> took, when you took the job, Diana. Tell me, what, what about the highlights? What, what or who have been the highlights of your time? in overseas house 
Oh, well, it's hard to pick out a few, and I don't want to repeat the ones that I've already mentioned in the online magazine that was published on the 1st of June. Um, so I just thought I might mention a few of the people, extraordinary people I've met, as well as obviously some uh, many members have extraordinary stories to tell. It's very much a people organisation, Rosal. It's about the people. Um, but I did have this wonderful moment when I had tea on my own with Princess Alexandra at Buckingham Palace. We had about an hour together just chatting, which was a very magical moment. And another occasion when Lord Luce invited um, Henry Kissinger and his wife and John and Norma Major for lunch at the Royal Overseas League. And I had the pleasure of meeting them and welcoming them to the club. And I never thought in my life that I would meet Henry Kissinger. So that was quite an amazing um, moment. But I think more than anything, it's the artists and musicians that I've met in the time that I've been there that have been um, almost life changing for me, uh, meeting the young musicians, so talented, um, Jonathan Radford and Ashley Fripp and Emily Sun, but also the artists, um, Dimple Shah from India and Kul Nadulu from South Africa. Um, and then we also had an exhibition with Ben Okri and uh, Rosemary Clooney. And I had this wonderful moment one evening when Ben Okri was talking me through uh, some of the paintings on display. And I just had to pinch myself to think that um, I was talking to this very, very famous writer, um, you know, in a personal um, private capacity. So th there's been lots of wonderful moments. And I think if people want to find out more about those people, do check our website, because many of them have done videos now, which you can see on our website. And they really are extraordinary people and inspiring, very inspiring. It's a cliche, Diana, to say that um, we must embrace change, but there's a lot of change going on and you must have seen a lot of changes. Tell us, how has the organisation changed during your time, during your tenure? Well, I think um, I, I wanted to mention first off the, the staff. I, it was quite a difficult situation when I first arrived and we've now got a much, much stronger team in place from the senior positions right through every level of the staff. And I know members really appreciate the care and attention they get from the staff at Rosal. Um, but the big project for me has been changing Rosal's governance and working with members of Central Council and the Rosal Trust to update the governance structures of both Rosal, the nonprofit organization set up under Royal Charter and the Rosal Trust, which is a charity in its own right um, and that's been a huge project, actually, and uh, has now more or less been completed. So um, I'm hoping in the future with the new structures, you'll see a much more open and transparent governance of Rosal, which will focus on the big picture on strategy and risk management and the long term finances of Rosal, supported, of course, by the director general and the professional executive team. And I think this will make Rosal much more resilient in the future because it's going to be tough the next few years and to be sustainable as an organization you've really got to have all the talents around the table and in your gov main governance structures and hopefully this future will this setup will allow us to do that and it'll be a future that works for all of our members and delivers our objectives which are of course to promote international friendship and serve humanity at large um, but we've also, the other thing we've done is started to put much more um, emphasis on the positive impact that donations and legacies to, to Rosal can, can make. And I'm very grateful to all the members currently and possibly in the future who've responded by supporting our music and arts programmes and our educational programmes. In fact, we received a donation of £20,000 just the other day for our educational programmes. So that was fantastic. And we're now obviously also trying to raise funds for our heritage conservation projects. Um, and thanks to a legacy, we can now actually begin to refurbish the drawing room. So it's, it's amazing what a difference support from our members can make. And if you think back to our beginnings um, mm -hmm. with Evelyn Wrench, the members actually fundraised by Vernon House. So, you know, it, it, was, it was always had fundraising at its heart as an organisation. So I think that's something that you'll see grow more in the future with our new Director General as well. Interesting. I've got two, um, in a way, different questions, but connected questions. What do you wish for in the future for ROSL? And how important is the Commonwealth connection? 
Well, I really hope Roswell will thrive in the future because its, its mission is still very um, relevant to today's world. In fact, possibly even more relevant as, as you see the world around us splitting into power blocks and um, uh, you know, international trade looking less, um, what's the word, less open than it used to be. So I really hope that Roswell will thrive and the ethos of Roswell will thrive in the future and that Overseas House will be transformed into the fantastic buildings that they should be and that our arts programme will remain at the centre of everything that we do because it's such a fantastic programme that we put on and that we're proud of our heritage as well and that we become a centre for all Commonwealth citizens in London because we all know the Royal Commonwealth Society doesn't have a building anymore um, and I think you know Rosal can really be that centre for Commonwealth organisations in London and citizens from around the world. But actually we are open to everybody. Mm. You don't just have to be a member of the Commonwealth to be a member mm. of Rosal. And our fastest growing uh, area for overseas membership recruitment is actually in the United States. So um, that's a great thing about Rosal. It's it, equality and diversity sit at the core of Rosal. And so we are open to all. Um, and I very much hope that you'll see, you know, membership recruitment beginning to grow again in the future. I mean, where better to stay in London than at Overseas House? It really is very, very special. And I know that Annette, our incoming Director General, has great ideas on how to, how to grow Rosal's profile, but also our membership, um, particularly amongst our Commonwealth communities in London. So I look forward to that. That's good. Diana, I'm sorry if this next question sounds a bit like an obituary, but what would you like to be remembered for? <laughs> oh, that's frightful, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, there's, there's a few, I think the main thing I'm really proud of is the team at Rosal and what we've built together because it has been a tough few years. And I think we all know that often adversity can can bring about a, you know a really strong bond between the people who've had to work through it together so i'm very grateful to my senior team colleagues and to the ones who've even recently joined us because i think we have built a lot of trust and confidence um, in each other and also our relationship between the senior team and the chairman and the council i think is much stronger now as well and i, I think that's really really important but the wider Rosal team is absolutely brilliant. They're so passionate and committed to the club. Um, and some, of course, have been there a very, very long time. And I think their passion and commitment to members, to the Rosal ethos, and to wanting to provide the very best service for our members is truly inspiring. And of course, this recent crisis has really brought us together um, and working as a team together. So, in some ways, you know, it's, we would never ever have wanted this to happen, but it has made us all appreciate each other more. And as you know, with Zoom, we can all see each other's <laughs> kitchens and drawing rooms and things now. We've learned a lot more about each other during this crisis. Um, and as, you, as I think you'd agree, um, an organization is only as good as the people who, who are in it. Um, and I'm also very proud of our new governance arrangements. I mean, it's been a complex process. Um, it's uh, involved a lot of external organisations like the Privy Council and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But the members of council that I've worked with on that have been brilliant in steering us through. And um, the council has been very supportive and we're so grateful to the members who joined the AGM and the EGM recently and voted unanimously for those changes. So they'll now be, all that paperwork will now be going to the Privy Council for formal approval. Um, and I hope we might get that perhaps in October this year. And that will be, I think, a big, big legacy that I will be leaving to Rosal um, for the future. And I hopefully Annette uh, will enjoy um, working with the new council and being able to have a, a perhaps a more professional relationship with the new council. And, and I think that will help Rosal to be better equipped to, to face the challenges ahead, because there are undoubtedly will be challenges ahead. Um, so I think the team and the governance are the two things that I'm really, really proud of. Thank you. Now a question about now, but also looking ahead. 
Dan, a phrase that's crept into the lexicon thanks to COVID-19 is the new normal, meaning the suggestion that once this pandemic has passed, things, or at least some things, will not revert to being completely as they were. With the experience that you've gathered running ROSL, what do you think the new normal will be for London clubs, London clubs in general, like ours, as we all come to terms with living with this particular coronavirus? And just give me some examples of what you mean. Yeah, I wish I had a crystal ball. I think we probably all do um, and could answer that. Um, but there are a couple of things that I think we will see uh, more of as a result of this crisis. Um, I think there'll be much more of these online events and um, virtual events <laughs> like we, we have DG drinks still every week on a Tuesday evening online. And actually, I think we're all rather enjoying it. We've become a little sort of team who meet every Tuesday evening to, to just chat. And, you know, we have members joining from America, from Ghana, from Sweden, from um, I'm just trying to remember now, we've had from <clears throat> all over the place, really. And it's really interesting to hear the experience of different members around the world. Um, the AGM, I thought, worked well online. And I think next year we'll probably have a physical AGM if we can, and a, which will also be broadcast online. And we have, last summer, we installed in the Princess Alexandra Hall a whole new audiovisual system, which will enable us to broadcast um, or live stream, I think is probably the technical term, um, concerts and other events from the Princess Alexandra Hall, like the Evelyn Wrench lecture series and so on, and also put them on our website, which will be mean that wherever you are in the world, you'll be able to tune into Rosal events. There's also um, a Rosal book club, which is online, gone online now. There are uh, various other informal Rosal groups getting together online so I think that will help actually bring the members together more closely um, because I, what I've learned with our members is they do like to chat and be sociable you know that's why they're members of a club like Rosal so all of that will will I think help in the future. I think another thing that perhaps will change as a result of this is that we've all got used to working from home um, so much of that might stay in the future, partly to protect staff um, from having to travel a lot, but also it will mean we perhaps we won't need such um, extensive offices. I mean, actually, we're quite squashed in our offices at Rosal, and it is quite an issue trying to find desk space for everybody. But maybe now we can work in different working patterns and different times of the day, and some people can work some part of the week at home and some part in the clubhouse. So. It'll also be easier for council members, committee members of our committees and so on to hold meetings. I've noticed during this pandemic that actually attendance at our council meetings is almost 100% now because people don't have to travel to London to, be, to take part in the meetings. And as for our members, I think, um, in speaking particularly to the younger members, I think there perhaps will be more people wanting to work at the clubhouse on their laptops and we'll need to think about how we accommodate that because um, particularly our younger members were saying to me that you know if you haven't got an office to go to anymore you don't really want to have to stay at home every day of the week so they would love to be able to come into the clubhouse with their laptops and work in those lovely surroundings and possibly even in the garden if we can make that work um, and why not you know if people if people want that and we can provide it then we should um, so, but there is that issue about social socialising and social spaces, which are clearly the key to any any club environment. Um, and we're, but we are very lucky at Rosal. We've got some big spaces. We've got the drawing room, the Mountbatten room, and we're also looking at places like the Hall of India and Pakistan, which could be very easily converted into extra lounge space. And our restaurant downstairs is also a you know, a big space which could be used all through the day for um, either for working or for meetings or whatever people um, need. And of course, we've got the garden as well in the summer months. So I think although we might not be able to socialise in big numbers, um, as we have in the past for a few more months, there is an opportunity to perhaps use the spaces within the clubhouse in different ways, which will be, um, which will evolve, I think, over time. But 
having that opportunity to be somewhere else but still carry on your business um, as usual I think would be great we'll have to be in smaller groups and I think there'll be much more um, takeaway options or pop-up catering and, and bar options we're just looking at all of that at the moment and I noticed that some of our very upmarket neighboring restaurants um, in German Street for example are offering now takeaway um, lunches and suppers so you can get them from Wilton's and Franco's and you know all the big restaurants around us Chutney Mary they're all offering takeaways so we're just trying to think about how we can how we can make the best of that um, I've got two more points I want to make about how life might change and one of them is that um, I think what this crisis has shown us is that we must be more environmentally aware in everything that we do because there's no doubt that there's a link between the way uh, we have destroyed much of our natural surroundings and this pandemic. The WHO and UN published a report only yesterday um, which talks about the need to behave more responsibly in the future and to recognise the impact um, and the consequences of the destruction of much of our natural uh, environment. Um, we, I won't go into that in great detail, but I think we, that is something that we'll need to take account of in everything that we do in the future. Um, and, and one of those consequences of that being more environmentally responsible and aware is that um, international travel might be very different and more restricted in the future. Um, and I think that will have a big impact on us, at least in the short term. Um, so we'll probably see a lot more of our London and UK members in, in, in the club. Um, but I hope that members from wherever they are will still feel that they want to come to London and visit the clubhouse because um, it will be a very safe environment. We're looking at putting in all the COVID secure measures that we need to put in to make everyone feel safe. And it hopefully will still feel like a home away from home, despite the old Perspex screen here and there. Um, and our teams are doing everything possible to make sure that they're safe that anyone visiting is safe despite and and in line with all the new restrictions so I think those are the main changes it's very hard to to really see what impact this pandemic will have in the longer term but there's no doubt that there will be big structural changes coming through in in many areas less business travel as well as another example because we've all got used to having meetings online. So why do we need to fly to New York for a two hour meeting? We don't need to do that. So it's going to be interesting, I think, to see, see how that develops in the future. But there are some positives for us, of course, as an international organization, we can um, be in touch with each other, perhaps much more than we ever thought we could. So the new normal, it sounds quite full. It does, <laughs> really, it does. It's quite promising, uh, quite promising. Last question for me, and there are a few questions now coming in from people who are joining us online, but this is a rather uh, personal question, but the question is, how do you plan to spend your retirement? And I'm sure many people would love to know. Give us an uh -huh. some insights. Yes, um, I like to think of it more as a sabbatical, a bit of a break from uh, uh, the day to day. Um, and time to do all the things I really enjoy doing. Um, I've worked all my life. I've got um, two children. Um, who are now, of course, grown up. Um, I'd like to see more of them if they'd like to see me. But I also enjoy doing yoga. I'm thinking of training to be a yoga teacher. I'd love, love to walk some of the fabulous long distance paths in the UK. Um, and I'm also still involved with some um, charities and organisations, as you mentioned at the start in India. So I hope to be able to help them a bit more. Um, I might go back to writing as well. You mentioned that I have written sort of more on, at an academic level, um, but I, I might do some other uh, writing as well. Um, but I also hope to still be visiting Overseas House and also reading Overseas Magazine. And I'm very grateful to the chairman who yesterday um, said that they would be offering me uh, honorary membership when I leave. So that will, well done, well done. So I'm really pleased about that. Thank you very much to, to the members of council. So um, I hope to keep in touch with Rosal, but I obviously don't want to tread on the toes of my successor, but um, there's, I think we've all got a long list of things that we love to do. And we, 
it's about time management in the end, isn't it? And choosing to do the things that you want to do at that stage in your life. And I feel I'm at that stage now. So uh, watch this space. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. And many, many thanks for answering all of my questions. I can see from my screen that there are a few questions from our audience uh, for you. So let me read the first one to you, which has come in from a member called Peter Evans. And Peter writes, hello, Diana, further to our EGM, could I please ask that more present day languages used at ROSL, he means, or he says, non-gender specific and mindful of our multicultural society. And thank you, Diana, for all you have done to update our club and wishing you well for the future. That's from Peter Evans. Thank you very much, Peter. I think that's a really important point that you raise. And obviously, part of the uh, purpose of amending our Royal Charter was to update the language in there and remove um, references to imperialism or British Empire and, and other matters like that. But I think the, uh, the gender specific language as well is, is something that we will address. And of course, something that I've been particularly keen to address. And we, we do try to do that um, in everything that we do, but sometimes it's just force of habit, isn't it? You, you fall back into using the usual words all the time. But, you, but you're absolutely right. We need to be um, very aware of the language and the tone of our language as well that we use in, in everything. And I, I know John Cudlick, our new Director of Marketing, Membership and Communications, and his team um, are very aware of this point as well. So we, we do try to do that, but we'll, we'll try even harder, Peter. Got two more questions. A question from somebody called Alex Morris. I'm not sure whether Alex is male or female, but Alex Morris anyway, has asked, has Dr. Owen, this is directly to you, has Dr. Owen ever met or had dealings with Reed Martin, Austin Titchener, and Adam Long's reduced Shakespeare company? And for the benefit of us who are quite ignorant of that, maybe you could give us some insights into who, who this, these people are. Yes, I actually, I haven't met them personally myself, but of course know of them. Um, and I have seen um, productions based on their texts, which is, as it, as it says on the tin, really, they're, they are uh, reduced versions of Shakespeare's works, which are easier for... Um, perhaps uh, amateur groups or schools to perform. And they're very, very good, actually. They're very, very good. And um, I, I'm sure you can find them online. You must be able to find them, the Reduced Shakespeare Company. And actually that was the great thing about um, the Shakespeare world. It was so varied and there were so many different approaches to Shakespeare's work that um, there was something new happening nearly every day. And I remember when I went to China a few times um, because there was a, a, a crazy link between Shakespeare and China, which I won't bore you with now, but um, there they were quite puzzled at the idea that you could have many different interpretations of the same play hmm. um, and different understandings of the same play. And I, me I remember meeting students who sort of said to me, but surely, you must know whether Ophelia really did commit suicide or not. <laughs> and, you know, or you must know the answer to, you know, Hamlet and things. And I, I just said, well, actually, no, it's, it's, you know, it's up to the producer, the director, or it's up to you to interpret how you take that meaning. So, yes, um, Reduce Shakespeare Company, strongly recommend them. It's a question from a fellow member of my good friend, Alan Chalmers in Basel, in, here in Switzerland. Mm who um, says essentially what, and it's, it's a fair question, what are the contingency plans, <clears throat> excuse me, to maintain a Royal Overseas League presence in Edinburgh? Yes, the main, our main presence in Edinburgh now is our arts programme. So we still go to the festival every year for two weeks. Unfortunately, of course, this year we've had to cancel that but we do 30 concerts in two weeks at the Edinburgh Festival, um, which is a fantastic programme um, that we run up there. And also, um, I know that, again, thanks to another legacy, um, Jeff uh, Parkin, our artistic director, has, um, is setting up a programme to sponsor young Scottish musicians in Edinburgh as well. So we also used to do a Commonwealth Day lunch in Edinburgh, um, and various other activities like that. So I will be talking with our 
Annette, um, the new Director General, about how we might do more to maintain a presence in Edinburgh. I would say we do have a very strong presence through the Edinburgh Festival um, in Edinburgh. And of course, we would like to spread out. And actually, we have a project which we call Rosal on the Road, which is taking Rosal not just to Edinburgh, but to Manchester and Birmingham and, you know, Geneva or in, in different parts of the world so that it um, becomes much more available to members everywhere. And I know that Jeff um, has linked up with festivals in places like Buxton in Derbyshire, in the Lake District um, and around the UK so that our Rosal musicians can go and perform at these festivals. And it gives us an opportunity to talk about the Royal Overseas League. So we're very keen to take Rosal on the road, as we call it, um, to many places, not just to Edinburgh, um, because we think that's a, a really important project for us. And one of our members uh, in the North has very um, kindly, <coughs> excuse me, sponsored um, programmes in the Lake District. <coughs> excuse me. Take a glass of water, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll just fill the time in while you're clearing your throat with the next question. It's a very practical question while you have a gulp of water. And, it, and I can understand the, the reasons behind this question. It's from Andrew, no surname, from Andrew. How will Royal Overseas <coughs> League create income if many of the activities and events are to be online? Fair question. And how will staff recruitment be affected by likely Brexit Restrictions. You okay, Diana? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Bit croaky. Yeah. Um, Shall I repeat the question? Uh, <coughs> I think I'm okay. Um, we have looked at, we have discussed um, the possibility of asking, <coughs> sorry, either for donations or a small charge to attend Rosal events online. Um, and what was the second part of the question, Michael? It was to do with Brexit and uh, oh. how Brexit, it was to do with um, staff recruitment and whether they'll be affected yeah. or by the likely Brexit restrictions. <coughs> well, we've certainly seen an impact already in terms of recruitment for staff, particularly at the entry level posts of housekeepers and um, kitchen porters um, and the like. You mean fewer um, people coming forward? Yeah, many, many fewer. I think it's particularly hitting the catering industry. Yeah. But also we've seen it um, in the hotel side of the business. Um, so we do what we can to support our staff who um, are, are from Europe and perhaps need help with or advice on how to secure the visas that they need or yeah. other, other travel restrictions. But it is going to be more difficult in the future. And there's more competition, of course, from other other clubs and hotels in the district who are trying to also who are also facing recruitment shortages yeah. um i'm not sure how it will play out in the long term but we're very lucky actually we have a very loyal um team of staff who we're doing everything we can to support through the pandemic so that when we reopen which we now hope will be in august we've got a team already in place and we're not trying to go out and re-recruit in the marketplace. Okay, I'm just going to give you a chance to rest that voice. And <laughs> there'll be like two more things to say, and then we'll, we'll draw it to a close because it sounds as if that, that throat of yours is suffering a little bit. One's uh, some praise and one's a very interesting question. There's not a question, this is from Palmer Carter. Palmer Carter writes, not a question, but a greeting from Ireland to Ireland, wish you yeah. a happy retirement and thank you for your support and making a visit so enjoyable, Palmer Carter. And the last question, which will bring a smile to your face, from Matt Owen, who asked, which long distance UK walk are you most excited to undertake following your retirement, Diana? Oh, that's my son, I think. That's your son. Oh, Matt, I, oh, I didn't be. make the connection. Okay. I don't, it might be. I don't know. It could be, okay. But I think probably um, the southwest coast path has always been on my list Good. to do. Good choice. I grew up in the west of England, so yeah. I know that part of the coastline as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, that's all. To do. That's all we have time for, everyone. Thank you for all your questions. I apologise and blame me completely for those of you who are lucky to have your question read out. Grateful thanks to you, Diana, on behalf of everyone out there, members and non-members. I wish you a very happy and fruitful retirement. 
Thank you, Michael. And thank you as well for, for hosting this event and for leading me through the questions and <laughs> answers there. So thank you very much, Michael. It's and, been a um, privilege. It's been a privilege. Good thank luck. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye.